All right, I think we are uh, ready to start. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on uh, where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Giacomo Persi Paoli. I'm the head of Unidir's security and technology program, and uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, side event today. Uh, again, whether you're joining us here in New York in the room, and I'm very happy to see so many of you uh, around the table or uh, online. So for those of you who might be less familiar with, uh, uh, with us and, and UNIDIR, uh, UNIDIR is a, an independent and autonomous institute, a research institute within the UN um, that focuses on disarmament and international security uh, issues. Our goal is really to try to assist the international community to develop practical ideas uh, and action-oriented ideas uh, that are really needed to find practical solutions to growing security concerns. And, you know, as the world around us is telling us every day, we have plenty of those. Um, also, of course, uh, I should say that uh, UNIDIR is a voluntary funded organization. Uh, so we, nothing of what we do would be possible without the general support of all of our donors and sponsors. With regard to today's event, I'm just going to give uh, a quick uh, introductory uh, or framing uh, remarks before uh, uh, giving the floor to uh, Ambassador Zanheisen from uh, the mission of Germany for some introductory remarks. And then uh, my colleague Sarah, who has been leading the study uh, on uh, futures that we've conducted, will take us through the rest of the day. Uh, to give you some wider context to this event, um, since uh, September last year, so it's uh, just over a year now, we've been conducting a research study that is really trying to look at uh, what would international security look like in 2045, so by the time the UN looks, turns 100. You know, if we had to pick any, any time uh, in, in the future, we said, okay, let's try to pick a, a pivotal one, and this one, the UN will turn 100. And the purpose was really uh, trying to understand what kind of challenges could the world be facing from an international security, arms control, and disarmament perspective? And based on those challenges, what are some of the actions that we can start to think today that we may potentially put in place in order to mitigate some of those uh, risks? And it's important that when we think about challenges, um, we really try to go beyond the comfort of looking at one issue at the time I know it's already very complicated to do that, and it's uh, very difficult at times to even find consensus on one issue at a time. But if we look at climate, development, conflict, global health, etc., all of these issues are clearly complex in, in their own merit, but they're also in incredibly interconnected and mutually dependent. And this is because in the real world, you know, we live, uh, and you know, we live in a world of concurrency. We deal with concurrency, which means you know, multiple things will happen all at the same time, and we will never be dealing with only one conflict. There is, a, you know, there's a conflict that is climate change in the global pandemic, and you know, development issues are always there. So we're the world is complex. Drivers of international peace and security are multiple, and we should really try to have that mindset when we're thinking about futures and, and foresight. Ultimately, our starting assumption for this whole study is that international security is not an independent variable, so to speak. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. International security ultimately is the result of a combination of different uh, drivers. So we decided to undertake this research study for several uh, reasons. Of course, you, you will be uh, uh, all aware of the discussion that were initiated last year with this idea of the summit uh, of the future, with this idea of the SG to really try to promote a more future-oriented uh, approach, a more kind of strategic foresight approach to the work that the UN does. So we decided to start this study um, to help the multilateral community think beyond day-to-day -day issues. Not that day-to-day -day issues are not important, they clearly are, but we felt that an organization like UNIDIR could really provide that intellectual space where the community can try to you know, stretch a little bit uh, their, their thinking and uh, go beyond the day-to-day -day business and really start to practice some of those strategic foresight uh, 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 initiatives and exercises that the SG has been uh, alluding to. Uh, arms control and disarmament processes, of course, can uh, often become concentrated and focused on 
on the mandate that they have, on the rules of procedures. I mean, there are uh, there is a lot of structure around the discussion on these topics, and that is, of course, necessary uh, to make sure that some form of uh, 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 progress is made. But at the same time, uh, they represent they can represent constraints over the extent to which states can engage on on broader. Uh, on broader levels and, and higher levels. So we really wanted to bring to the front, uh, you know, issues that we believe are of critical importance to this community when projecting itself a little bit further ahead. That is from a substantial, substantive perspective. But we also wanted to socialize, if you want, or bring to the table uh, new tools, new ways, new methodologies, new ways of thinking um, you know, futures and foresight methods are very popular, perhaps not in this community, but outside of this community, they're very popular, whether it's in business, whether it is in, in uh, other policy setting. Uh, they're definitely very powerful tools that do not provide solutions. The, the, in a way, the, the goal is not to predict the future. If you're approaching this with the idea we're going to predict the future, you, you know, that won't happen. <laughs> but uh, those are very useful tools that can help you think about the future in a structured way. And by doing so, help you identify um, or make strategic choices of, of where, you want, uh, where you want to go. So we really wanted these methods uh, to, to, to bring these methods to the table, to start socializing them uh, with you. This project is, of course, the beginning of what we hope to be a longer journey into this, uh, into this field. There are very powerful ways, very powerful tools to manage uncertainty, volatility of the environment. So we really wanted to, to be uh, advocates of futures and foresight in the context of international uh, peace and security. Finally, uh, I would just like to say that this, this uh, project and this effort is, is in line with the, the mandate that UNIDIR was given when it was founded in, in 1980. Uh, so it's been a while, but you know, our mandate says that among the many things that we do, we should also be carrying out more in-depth, forward-looking and long-term research on disarmament so as to provide a general insight into the problems involved and stimulating new initiatives for new negotiations. So this is clearly us trying to uh, live up to this very important pillar of our mandate that oftentimes tends to be overlooked by the necessities of the today. So really this project is really helping us uh, focus more on the tomorrow. Sarah will provide way more details about everything I just said uh, and, and the project itself. Uh, but before I, uh, I give her the floor, I just uh, wanted to invite uh, Ambassador Zanheisen to share with us uh, some uh, introductory remarks and also thanking you again for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Giacomo, and dear colleagues, uh, welcome, and thank you for attending this, this meeting, and thank you very much to United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research for, for really organizing this. I think much of what I wanted to say has, has been exact perfectly covered by you, so I'm, I'm struggling a bit what I will say now. Um, but I will start with one apology from, from my colleague, uh, Ambassador Thomas Goebel from Geneva. He was actually supposed to speak here. He's unfortunately already on his way to Cambodia for our uh, Ottawa uh, Treaty Conference, Ottawa Convention Conference, so he will not join us. So you have to bear with me. I would like to a little bit reflect what you said, Jack Moore, from a slightly different angle. I mean, if you work here, and I think you and, and co colleagues from the first committee, I think you may share the feeling that many of us have in the, the wider body of the United Nations, that sometimes we have the feeling that current events overwhelm us, that we are very large in a, reflect, in a reactive mode. I mean, there are, of course, effect, uh, objective reasons why we are in such a situation. We are confronted with a multiplicity of crises, not least the unprecedented aggressions against Ukraine and now against Israel. All these crises seem to compound each other and they led to unprecedented tensions and polarizations in the international system. At the same time, I believe we all share the conviction that we, we actually need to do more than solely work in a reactive crisis management mode. I think we all share the feeling, I suppose, that we have the duty to look beyond current crises and that we need to do more than so um, scanning the horizon, identify future threats, 
and then act together in order to prevent them, ideally, or at least mitigate the impact of emerging challenges once we have perceived them. Now, I think we also share the feeling that we need to find better answers to those very complex, often heavily interrelated emerging threats. And we all struggle for these answers, I think nationally and internationally. At least for my country, Germany, we have just published our own first ever national security strategy. It's exactly about the struggle to find answers to the question, what will be the future challenges to international security? And so we try to cover a number of subjects as diverse as climate change, uh, resource uh, conflicts, water conflicts, energy security. But we also try to find um, answers for comprehensive approaches um, beyond a narrow hard security defense logic. And we try to focus on questions of resilience, sustainability, inclusiveness, and the transformative power of women through a feminist foreign policy. But at the same time, our national security strategy always makes it very clear that the answer to future global threats cannot be found in isolation. I think national answers are never enough, and we must work multilaterally with the United Nations at its core if we really want to be successful. The Secretary General's two reports now, the important report, Our Common Agenda, and then more recently, the policy paper, New Agenda for Peace, I think show us very well the way forward in this regard, and Giacomo, you already mentioned many of the, the elements. I think the report does not isolate disarmament and peace, but it makes, makes it very clear that we must see the interrelation with other important challenges, current and future. And one of them, for instance, governance of emerging technologies. The report also makes it very clear that our answers must be comprehensive, forward-looking, he always says bold, they have to transcend silos. They have to understand the complexity of interrelated conflicts and challenges. And it has to be broad in its response, which means we have to include actors, crucial actors like women in their role in peace and security, a more substantial youth engagement, the inclusion of civil society, academia, private entities. They all play a pivotal role if we want to find answers. As a co-facilitator of the Summer of the Future, and I think I can also talk with Helena here for Namibia, I think we both, we will work very hard to have a productive and forward-looking discussion on this very matter during the upcoming negotiations. And it is absolutely crucial, and thank you very much for really engaging us in this, this kind of forward-looking, out-of-the-box thinking, beyond the nitty-gritty of, of, of lines, PPs and OPs and, and comments on reports, but really thinking ahead, doing that today, I think, uh, it will be helpful. I'm really looking forward to the thoughts of, of the panelists today, and I think we, should, we can take all a lot back from, our, from this discussion. You colleagues to the first committee, and Helen and I, and our team certainly back to our preparation of the sum of the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for your uh, uh, for sharing with us your your views and and, and remarks. And uh, with that, I give the floor to uh, Sarah. Over to you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Giacomo. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Sarah Grant Clement, um, and I am a researcher within UNIDIR and have been leading our study on exploring the future of. Um, international peace and security. Um, so thank you once again, Giacomo, for those uh, remarks, and also Ambassador for, for your very insightful thoughts as well. Um, so I wish to start off by providing a further detail about the research that UNIDIR has uh, undertaken, particularly for those in the audience who may not be so familiar with the project that we have been working on for the best part of a year uh, now. Uh, so specifically, we sought to, through the creation of uh, future scenarios, stimulate discussions on what we need to do today uh, in order to prepare and pave the path for the type of future we would like to see. Um, to do so, we created a series of hypothetical future scenarios uh, depicting how the world might look like uh, in 2045, uh, the United Nations 100th anniversary. Uh, in total, we created uh, five different scenarios depicting um, the similar factors uh, or between them, but developing in different ways. Um, 
And really here, the scenarios aim to take into account the connections and interdependence between these different factors um, which make up the scenarios. And as you've heard today, this is we can't take one uh, single factor in isolation. It has to be uh, integrated within um, a broader uh, range of uh, impacts. Really, the scenarios, though I should stress, are not meant to be predictive in any way. Uh, rather, the intention was to use them as tools for discussion, encourage really that sharing of ideas and exploration of issues, threats, and ways forward uh, on the matter of international peace and security, with a specific focus on issues which relate to arms control and disarmament. Um, we involve nearly 100 experts throughout the entire study, from the creation of the scenarios to their assessment, which took place through a series of workshops and quite a lot of interviews. Uh, we have now concluded the research and are preparing the findings, which we plan to release before the end of the year. And we really hope that these will help member states, colleagues within the United Nations, and other stakeholders um, in their thinking and preparations ahead of the summit for the future. Uh, so today, I won't be presenting the scenarios or the preliminary findings. Rather, the aim of the event is to broaden the conversation beyond the initial set of experts that we engaged with to date. Uh, we really want to foster a broader discussion on issues pertaining to international peace and security and identify additional elements um, which might be relevant for us to consider as we finalize their report and also focus on considerations uh, regarding arms control and disarmament, uh, particularly uh, as you know, First Committee is ongoing and in the context of discussions ahead of the summit of the future. Uh, to that end, I'm delighted to be joined here today uh, in person as well as virtually um, by uh, the following excellent speakers. Um, firstly, we have Elena Kuthi, um, Deputy Permanent Representative of the Namibian Mission to the United Nations. Um, and online, we have uh, Chris Ernie, Head of Futures Lab uh, within the United Nations, and Erica Gregory, Managing Director of N Square and Horizon 2045. Uh, before we dive into our discussion, however, uh, just a few housekeeping and administrative remarks. Um, there will be time for Q&A uh, after the interventions from our speakers. Um, and for those of you joining online, you will have the option to take the floor or uh, submit your question uh, via the chat. Um, for those in the room, there are sign-in sheets. If you haven't filled them out already, um, I would encourage you to and to circulate them uh, around the room. Uh, and for those online, you should see a poll appear uh, just to take a few um, data elements. I uh, also just want to note that this meeting will be recorded and will uh, subsequently be made available on uh, UNIDIR's website uh, following this event. So, as mentioned, uh, UNIDIR undertakes, has undertaken this novel exploratory research um, into the issue of the uh, future of uh, international security. Um, and beyond the contributions that we have received so far, um, which have been many and varied because there are many different perspectives on the threats facing international security and what could be done to address them. But here I really want to engage with our panelists um, to discuss some of these uh, areas further um, and dig deeper based on your different areas of uh, expertise. Um, so starting off with the first question, uh, I want to uh, turn to uh, our panel um, and ask from your perspective, what you see as being the main areas or threats to international security uh, that would require to be addressed uh, by the international community. Um, I'll first give the floor to Helena, um, and then I propose that we go online, uh, starting with Erica and then Chris. Um, Helena, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. And thank you also to everybody who's joined us this afternoon. Uh, if I can just start by saying, at uh, its formation, one of the primary goals of the United Nations was to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And that framing alone tells us that uh, there's value in lived experience, and war is the absolute worst-case scenario. So in applying the futures and foresights uh, lens to the work of the United Nations, I think there's value in reimagining a world that is firstly better than the world that we have today, but secondly, also, and more importantly, never worse off than what we've had it at its worst before. 
So uh, with, with that in mind, I think the first threat that I'd like to point to is uh, the fact that the state of perpetual war and conflict, raging conflict, has almost become a new normal. And currently, there are 107 active conflicts in the world. And depending on who you ask, that number is, is, is higher. The consequence of that is, of course, that you have many internally displaced persons, you have humanitarian crises, you have the use of incendiary weapons, cluster munitions, sophisticated arms, chemical and biological weapons being used, heightened global tensions, armed conflicts, the proliferation of small arms and, and light weapons. Coupled with the non-adherence to international norms, conventions, treaties, and just everything that creates a rules-based order for us, and then, of course, the complete disregard of the uh, disarmament machinery. So, basically, when we have the use of, of sort of arms build-up, modernization of armaments, the uh, increased investment in armaments as a, a means of trying to build better security. This is a challenge for us because it doesn't create a scenario where the world is heading in the direction that we've, we, we would want it to, to be in, a direction that is better off. The second threat that I'd like to point to, which is non-traditional in the sense of, of linking it to international peace and security, relates to human security, in that when the material conditions that people find themselves in specifically as they relate to a dignified life, uh, are untenable, where we have a world that cannot sustain the economic, food, health, environmental, personal community, and political security, yet we have uh, funds to modernize armament and to spend on, 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 uh, on funding conflict. Uh, I think the persistent state of underdevelopment that the world finds itself in and the growing inequality is a major threat to international peace and security, and we must address that in, in earnest. If I can draw from the African context where we've taken Agenda 2063 and the initiative to, to silence the guns uh, as an important underpinning for, for the del de delivery of, of development and, and a sustainable way of life, I think this is... The, one of the ways in which the African peace and security architecture maybe has had a little bit of foresight in, in the planning that, was, that has been done at continental level. But I think as we uh, engage deeper in this discussion, there are, as have been mentioned by many of the speakers before me, opportunities for us to reflect on what is presented to us within the context of the new agenda for peace and within the context of, of our common agenda. I don't want to delve too much into the just sheer risk that is posed by the existence of nuclear weapons. I think uh, maybe I'll give a chance to other colleagues uh, to, to give that, to, to, to delve into that. But I thought if I could just start with those two threats as, as immediate challenges that we do need to look at. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Helena. And indeed, it was not made explicit, but there are definite links with Agenda 2030 as well and your remarks and kind of the interlinkages between the SDGs. But without further ado, um, Eric, I will give you the floor. Very good. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm uh, honored to be with you. Uh, so, you know, there are so many things to choose from. How does one choose which threat to talk about here? Um, and I, uh, in thinking about being with you all, uh, it occurs to me that the, really the greatest security threat we face is human nature uh, and the fact that we're not, as a species, evolving fast enough to keep up with the changes that we have wrought uh, or have imposed on the world around us. We're not only stuck in mental models that no longer serve us, and this is really relevant to all of your comments earlier about the important work you're doing on foresight. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, but we are also generally unaware that these mental models that we hold uh, unconsciously, for the most part, control the decisions we make uh, and, in, and by extension control what's possible in the world around us. And as I was thinking about uh, being with you, I did a little bit of homework on this notion of mental models. And um, the first, the earliest mention I could find in the literature about mental models uh, came from a, a cognitive scientist named Kenneth Craig, who unfortunately 
uh, it sounds like spontaneously died on a bicycle ride when he was about 31 years old, uh, which is really a shame because he talked about mental models as being the small scale models that we hold in our heads. Uh, and these are the, the ways we model the world around us, our external reality, so that we can think about choices and we can respond to the environment around us, um, having rehearsed our responses before the moment that we need them. Um, essentially, you, using what we know from past experience to react in what he called a fuller, safer, and more competent manner to the emergencies that we face. And uh, the reason I think it's um, such a tragedy, really, that someone who introduced that notion into the world uh, passed away when he did is that he was doing all of this thinking in 1943. Uh, the book in which he talks about mental models for the first time was published in 1943, just at the moment uh, that folks at RAND uh, were working on nuclear deterrence theory. And in fact, we have been living for the last 75 or 80 years uh, with nuclear deterrence, which is itself a mental model. And we have lots that we could say about nuclear deterrence as a mental model, as a construct about the world. But basically, I think we might agree that essentially it comes down to the idea that if human beings, and this is uh, the RAND researchers would have said this, or game theorists might have said this themselves, that uh, human beings really cannot be trusted to cooperate and the nations of the world cannot be trusted to cooperate. Uh, so coercion is really uh, the only path forward to what we all now think of as global stability. And that is a very complicated mental model that has left us stuck in many ways. It shapes and it limits the geopolitical landscape and it will shape and limit our future options. Uh, a colleague of ours, uh, we have a project called Horizon 2045, and in that project we collaborate with a wonderful neuroscientist named Bree Lincoln-Hoker at Stanford, um, who talks a lot about the fact that human brains and social groups didn't evolve to deal with the confluence of risks that we now face. Uh, we actually have significant barriers. They're cognitive, they're emotional, sociocultural barriers to engaging with the kinds of uh, risks we face. And as someone mentioned earlier, the confluence of those risks. We face cognitive overload. Life is really complicated. Modern life depletes our brain reserves. We discount the value of future events as we're thinking about what we're going to do today. And we know from the wicked problem theory, uh, from all the literature about wicked problems, that that matters in the policy world because we tend uh, to make policies today that discount future irrationality. And I think um, there are plenty exa of examples just from the last eight years, certainly in the United States and elsewhere, uh, where we've seen what happens when we discount the potential for human irrationality. And then finally, we have difficulties imagining the magnitudes of what we all now call existential risks. Our brains just don't let us do that easily. Uh, it's much easier for us to attend to risks that are salient, that we can easily imagine. Uh, and we prioritize those because we want to pay attention to the things that are happening right now that maybe we have agency over or feel agency over. And they happen to people like us. Um, that makes it easier for us to deal with them. And the problem with all of that is that we can't imagine what might be possible if we don't understand what's changing around us. This is why uh, uh, earlier somebody mentioned horizon scanning, paying attention to signals of change around us is really such a critical practice because as we pay attention to signals of change, we can see that we are gonna be called upon to think differently about the whole world around us. What will it mean 20 years from now, by 2045, to have global stability as we approach planetary boundaries won't our definitions have to change and the way we think about ourselves and each other have to change? And how will we say goodbye to the worlds that we've known and we've in many ways expected to go on forever? The natural environments, uh, the social and cultural environments that may actually be falling by the wayside and being supplanted by something else. 
And ultimately, this matters for global leaders deeply because we are now faced with complex decisions that have lasting consequences. And this is really, I would say, in the end, about how we are going to choose to deal with the tumult of the present so that we can envision a better future and catalyze this immense human capacity for being audacious and big and ingenious. But it starts with understanding how we think and what the limits of that thinking uh, have wrought uh, in, in the present. Thank you very much, uh, Erica. That's really uh, fascinating, and I also really like the perspective of bringing in cross-disciplinary kind of, you know, expertise and insights in uh, a world which we, we probably all come from similar backgrounds and have similar degrees. So bringing in kind of the neuroscience, the psychologists, the behavioral insights uh, can be very helpful. And I think that's also a good link to the Secretary General's um, uh, policy brief on UN 2.0 and some of the elements mentioned in there, um, and using uh, well. Of course, uh, strategic foresight um, and uh, other elements. But I think I, I'll give the floor to Chris because I don't want to step on your toes of perhaps some of the elements you might be mentioning. So Chris, over to you. Sarah, Giacomo, um, colleagues, thanks for thanks for hosting this uh, this discussion. It's a it's a real honour to be here, um, and um, and really congratulations on on all of the work that you. Um, and the colleagues have carried out on on that report. I enjoyed our uh, conversation when when um, when we spent a bit of time uh, together speaking about uh, threats and opportunities. Um, I'm kind of at a loss because everything I wanted to say has been said um, either in introductory remarks um, or uh, on or previous speakers. But so I'll start by saying one thing, and and that um, Erica, I just learned an, an awful lot uh, from from what you just said, and um, and it's given me some real. Uh, food for thought as we as we move uh, as we move forwards with our own endeavour with the with the futures lab. Look, I'm not a I'm not a peace and security expert. I work I work in the foresight space at, at the United Nations, so I'm more broadly familiar with the threats that that we're all concerned with. Uh, but from my perspective, I see three issues that I wanted to to speak to uh, that Giacomo kicked us off with. Um, so thanks, Giacomo. Um, first of all, um, I wanted to say, you know, we, we could talk about um, threats and, and areas that, that require uh, concern, whether we're talking cyber security, climate change, nuclear proliferation, growing uh, inequality, terrorism, economic disparities. We could talk at length as, as to why one or each of these areas require urgent attention, and, and they all surely do. Um, nonetheless, um, I really believe that um, in isolating threats, we're reinforcing old ways of working. Um, it encourages unjoined up approaches, which are clearly just not up to scratch uh, in the speed and cadence of change that we're currently experiencing. And so for me, I wanted to, to reinforce the messaging that, that Giacomo and others have, have already uh, brought us to today, um, that, that we need to think more about combinations of threats we need to think more about combinations of, of therefore, opportunity. Um, because otherwise, the, the approaches that, that we, we thus far have been taking uh, discourage new ways of working together um, with each other, as well as working with new actors who play or could play critical roles in the solution spaces. And this includes movements of people, civil society actors and organizations, including for-profit organizations, including urban areas, cities, and, and emerging spaces for, for solutions. Given the interconnected nature of today's world, threats rarely exist in, in isolation. And, and so we really need to spend the time and invest our, our time and resources in understanding the ways in which multiple threats can converge and amplify each other, making their combined impact even more significant and challenging uh, to address. Um, and secondly, uh, when, it, when it comes to combinations of threats, we need to be much, much better at identifying weak signals and the combinations and possibilities of weak sim signals interconnecting and, and converging, creating uh, global uh, challenges for us. So the key to preventing such combinations from escalating is, is number one, investing in our capabilities to identify those, those threats and those signals. But secondly, once we've done that, we need to be more proactive in uh, bringing these insights into our diplomacy. We need to be more um, 
uh, courageous in bringing these signals, often with, with different forms of, of evidence behind them, into international cooperation spaces and to form comprehensive strategies that embrace multiple futures. Um, so, so that's what I wanted to, to firstly say. We need to be better at, at understanding the, the potential um, manifestations of, of, of combinations of threats, as well as, therefore, combinations of, of, of opportunity and, and our ability to work together. Secondly, and this is a little bit more um, internal looking to, to our multilateral organizations, um, the tools and, and processes that we currently have in place, as well as the cultures that sometimes underpin them, um, to effectively deal with combinations of threats, let alone weaker signals that, that could cause longer problems, um, are just not where we need them to be. We've been historically effective um, in some instances at responding to crises uh, with more or less positive uh, results, but we're incredibly bad at responding to longer term threats. All of climate change, uh, climate change being a prime example of that. We're responding to wildfires in Canada, in Hawaii, but we're really unable to address, for example, the root causes of our change in climate. That, of course, has huge implications on global peace and security. Until we can, for example, address the incentive structures of a few extremely powerful companies so that they can use their resources for the good of the planet, we'll forever be dealing with the kaleidoscope of emergencies that larger scale trends and threats cause until it's too late. So we need to embrace VUCA. Um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's something that we're all familiar with, I think, in this space. And it's, it's our ability to deal with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, which often renders us unable to respond effectively. The Secretary General speaks about us sleepwalking into a climate catastrophe, and I believe there's a symmetry between that analogy and one of boiled frogs. Our multilateral system requires changes in approach that will otherwise render us ineffective to intervene and to affect changes our world needs, including in the peace and security of the UN investing quite seriously in capabilities which are not just tweaks and should not just be seen as tweaks to how we operate, but really speak to the cultures of how we uh, create across our United Nations new ways of, of dealing with complexity, new ways of dealing with ambiguity, new ways of dealing with the cadence of issues that we now face. So investing in innovation, data, behavioral efforts to create multilateralism that enable us to, to respond to more complexity. And a lot of this work is on the back end, creating job profiles, keeping the bureaucracy agile. And we have to make sure that as we, we become increasingly uh, active at understanding those threats and, 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 of course, those opportunities, that we keep our bureaucracy updated as well to match the cadence of changes that we need. And then the third uh, threat that I see is a threat of inaction, which is an obvious uh, threat to call out, but it's of course linked to my previous point, but I want to call this out in particular. Inaction creates power vacuums that others can fill. If traditional mechanisms and actors cannot act, then others surely will. In some cases, not from a place of malintent, but perhaps of naivety. Multinational tech companies, for example, have a hugely positive role to play in creating environments for dialogue, healthy exchanges of differing views. But if the multilateral spaces cannot uh, step in and, and intervene, then, then other organizations and, and perhaps private sector organizations will. And this can set a precedent um, in uh, creating um, you know, spaces where, not from malintent again, but organizations can, can really come in and disrupt in, in more negative ways. So those are the, those are the three uh, things that I wanted to speak about uh, in, in response to this question, Sarah. And I realize that a lot of this has been said before, so I apologize if I if I've badly uh, repeated or, or reformulated responses of more articulate speakers. Over to you. Uh, many thanks, Chris. Um, and, you know, not at all. This was um, really fascinating. I, I loved your point on kind of 
uh, identifying convergence and amplification of, of crisis. I, I don't think we do that enough indeed. Um, and I think your point on the enabling infrastructure for um, multilateralism is a very valid one, uh, because if that doesn't work well, then uh, it obviously impacts uh, the ability uh, to uh, undertake uh, arms control and disarmament and other issues. Um, of course, it's very easy to um, find issues and um, kind of, you know, uh, find areas that need to be improved, but it's much harder to identify what should be done about them. Um, we all like to complain, but finding solutions can be a bit more difficult. So the next question uh, is a bit trickier, but obviously we've touched upon a very wide range of threats, and I want to uh, turn to you now to. Uh, learn your thoughts on what you think should be examined or what you think can be done to identify the threats that either you mentioned or other panelists mentioned or maybe threats which weren't mentioned. So what what is the solution space and what does it look like? Uh, I suggest we start with um, Erica, uh, Chris, and then finish with Helena on this one. So Erica, over to you. Well, that's great. Um, and let me just uh, say back to you, Chris, I'm delighted that we're getting a chance to um, have these conversations in public this way. I, I suspect we're all sort of finding our um, our colleagues in conversations like this and, and would love to be uh, with you all more to tease these things out. Because Sarah, the truth is, I think if anybody says they have the solution, they're not being completely honest with themselves. I think all we really have is the opportunity to make informed experiments essentially. Um, and we can uh, be, do a better job of specifying what it is we wanna create together. It's clear to me, I think to many of us that we need new multimodal models for engagement. Uh, ways to engage individuals who are not normally in the room for conversations about uh, threat, stability, security, all these big words that means something very different from wherever you sit in the world. Um, so engaging individuals, groups, systems in taking actions that diminish the threats we face. Now, I we are experimenting, I'm sure many of us in this conversation are experimenting with new ways of doing that, of engaging people. Um, essentially, we need new heuristics uh, to answer the core questions about how the confluence of threats, maybe we call it the poly crisis, uh, will reshape systems of human and planetary security. We can't expect that the systems we know today will continue um, as they have in the past because the world around us is changing, not to, not to make too fine a point of that. Um, so how is it that we can convene people um, recognizing the footprint of traveling to be together in person, recognizing the limitations of operating uh, remotely as some of us are doing right now in this call, how is it that we can actually convene in new ways to challenge mental models and the beliefs of decision makers um, and offer them new ways to think about the world and the people around them? Um, so we need, uh, in, in our experiments with this work, uh, we're launching a pilot program actually in January, and I hope some of you uh, listening to this conversation may actually participate in it, um, which is a series of conversations, most of them will in fact happen online, um, that are about beginning with the present and the multiple ways we experience the present, because I think we make a, a significant mistake if we imagine that the only problem we have is that we're not good at imagining the future. In fact, we're not very good at imagining the present either, or walking in the shoes of people who are not like ourselves. Um, and I think we're seeing the absolutely tragic consequences of that failure in terms of our human capacity right now, this week. Um, and so we will start with a process of understanding the multiple ways of really understanding, making sense of the world around us today, in order then to take an imaginative leap into the future and Sarah to be using many of the same techniques that you're talking about in terms of alternative future scenarios to immerse people in what it will actually feel like to inhabit those worlds so that we can develop greater strategic empathy um, not just uh, an understanding of how people are different and will operate differently in the future, but so that we understand what our strategic options are in light of their behaviors and their attitudes and their mores. 
I read an interesting uh, piece of research recently from the Pew Charitable Trust that um, seems to indicate that millennials and Generation Z people, <laughs> like my children, um, are the first generation since we've been paying attention to this who are unlikely to become more conservative as they age. Now, that's a pretty interesting uh, trend, if in fact that plays out the way the evidence seems to be demonstrating, uh, that people who will be in positions of global leadership by the year 2045 are less likely than their parents were to become more conservative as they age. That's really fascinating. What are the implications then for the kinds of strategies uh, that they may employ or decisions they're likely to make? Uh, what will it mean that those future decision makers have grown up at a time where the world feels tremendously fragile and where they are more aware than we've probably ever been, except potentially um, many generations ago, uh, of our the interrelatedness of the actions we take today with the experience of future generations. Uh, the people who are young adults today are growing up with a real awareness of those issues. So the, the kinds of processes that we take people through, uh, which I'm describing here, are really all about being able to get to fresh, novel insights so that we can make better recommendations to global leaders about uh, the choices they have for policymaking and for strategy. And some of that means really more deeply understanding how we reimagine the power dynamics and the systems we operate in today and the rules and norms of the systems we operate in because those are changing. So what will it mean uh, as we go through, as we convene people to make better decisions, what will it mean to understand the role of say decentralized autonomous organizations and other innovations that are enabled by distributed ledger systems to aggregate people, to aggregate uh, social capital, uh, financial capital, and actually exert agency in a way that may in fact disintermediate nation states as we know them today. Uh, we ought to be paying attention to that. These early experiments are messy. We have we don't need to look further than the FTX crash to understand why the crypto space is problematic. But these experiments are pointing at something uh, about the rise of a new form of power that we really ought to understand as we think about 20 or 30 years in the future. And similarly, we ought to be looking at the uh, implications of legal precedents that are being established in, say, the environmental space or the humanitarian law space uh, that could provide new arguments, uh, for instance, uh, for the legal prohibition of nuclear weapons. Uh, what constitutional provisions or court decisions or legislation or treaties or other legal tools are being uh, employed right now uh, that might actually transfer over into security decisions and the legality of some of the behaviors that we have lived with at least as long as I've been alive. Uh, so th these are the kinds of things as we convene uh, decision makers and the people who influence them uh, that we think we need to be talking about. And that means digging in under the kind of formal convenings that we often hold into a messier and, and frankly, I think a more difficult set of conversations about the ways in which we're different from each other and not just the same as each other. Thank you so much, Erica. These were really fascinating remarks. Um, and uh, I particularly like, you know, your, your notion of under, needing to understand the present. Um, and I think that's, that's really, um, r really insightful indeed. Um, I will now turn to Chris. Um, so Chris, you have the floor. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, look, I think, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's such a, it's such a big, question is like how do we do all of this um but but there are there are five things i think that immediately spring to mind uh, which which start to head down a, a bit of an answer to your question um i think the first thing is we have to double down on multilateralism um and i know that's it probably sounds really obvious and it is obvious for at least for me and and all of the um all the bias that i bring to the table but if we don't have the if we if we can't speak to each other um and we can't speak to each other about our concerns as well as our aspirations and hopes, then 
we're really doomed. Um, so we, we, we certainly have to double down on multilateralism. We have to, we have to um, you know, engage and, and invest in organizations like our, our beautiful and often frustrating United Nations uh, because we, we have to have these sacred spaces to, to talk and to listen and to converse and to disagree, um, but, in, but in managed ways and respectful ways. But secondly, I think that we need to rethink how we can engage with those who are perhaps unfamiliar with these spaces and in really transparent and humble ways. Um, you know, we've got AI labs out there creating foundational models. Um, you know, and we, we, could, we could go down that rabbit hole of, of, of what that actually means. But, 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 you know, we need to create these spaces of dialogue to, to be more inclusive, to bring in that diversity of thought and experience and, and, and hopes and aspirations. Um, and so, so we, we need to uh, continue to open up our um, UN spaces, our multilateral spaces, to have those dialogues and, and, and to create spaces of understanding, um, expectation management, um, and ultimately accountability. Um, I think thirdly, and, and Erica was really touching upon this, um, you know, our, our um, appetite to experiment it has to be high at the moment um, because underpinning any wish or drive to experiment is the courage to question assumptions. And as long as we're questioning our assumptions uh, that underpin, you know, the values of, of what we're doing, let alone the, you know, the interventions at, at, um, at various levels, um, we, we, need to, we need to be able to identify the assumptions we need to test. We need to be really crystal clear on the hypotheses of what we're testing. And we need to be um, humble enough to share the lessons learnt from our experiments, crucially of what hasn't worked as, as well as what has. And the fourth thing I think is that um, we need to be uh, more assertive about how we partner and what partnerships mean uh, within our multilateral spaces, which tend to be a little bit more transactional, a little bit more rigid. Um, but as we move into more complexity and more complicatedness, our ability and our, our, um, our drive and appetite to partner need to change in, in, very, uh, in, in quite um, also experimental ways. We need to look at new combinations of new organizations working together, you know, engaging around st strategic foresight deliberately um, very, very strategically, um, and 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 going down that path to action that embraces that diversity of experience and, and that diversity of values that that creates a better future or better futures. And then fifth, um, and I think I mentioned um, this word already, but with all of this work, we're really uh, examining what accountability means to all of us. Um, and without our ability to speak to each other and to understand aspirations and, and fears, we're going to be unable to examine accountabilities and really reinforce account accountabilities to, to both people and, and planet. And that's, and that's really at the core of this discussion today and, and any actions moving out of it. But I'll, um, I'll pass back over to you, Sarah, um, because uh, I'm sure there, there are more interesting uh, comments to come. Over. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, and I, I like that in both uh, yours and Erica's remarks, you really mentioned kind of the stakeholder groups and the community that we're engaging with. So it's really nice to see that there's a res thread forming there. Um, but Helena, please, I want to give you the floor. Thank you very much. So from my side, uh, I think the threats are driven by a lack of universalization of the application of the rules, norms that govern the international peace and security framework. And I think there is a sort of provision for compliance and of it for international law, international humanitarian law, to treaties, conventions, the UN Charter, for all in all circumstances. Um, but this is a major challenge. I think uh, there, as a result of, of us not always being, to enforce, being able to enforce accountability and, and, and compliance, we find ourselves in a situation where we have a universal set of standards that we've set for ourselves, uh, but at the same time we have a tendency to create pockets of exceptions to say that there are sort of caveats and there are situations in which uh, this applies to everybody else, but we do uh, uh, something that's called othering. I, I, I like to use the terminology of othering, that this applies to everybody, but wait, you're other, so... 
uh, in this instance, it doesn't apply to you. And I think uh, we have a responsibility to reflect deeply on this, and we must muster up the courage to really delve into this inconsistency in the application of the standards that we've set ourselves, because that's the way in which we'll be able to really uh, inspire confidence in our stated commitments to international law and the provisions of the Charter. And at the heart of the discontent in the world, I think, is the, the scourge of inequality, and inequality not only within the framework of the development space, but also in the framework of how we apply international law and how we apply issues, uh, how we put it into motion when uh, we use it in the context of international peace and security. So if we really want to commit to leaving nobody behind, I think our, our actions must address these challenges and we, mu and we must know that we stand to be rewarded with a more peaceful, stable and sustainable world. If I can just also bring that full circle to the development side, I think we have a responsibility to also scale up financing for development. We cannot talk about having money for uh, funding conflict and not having money to, to, to support development. I think without this, we wither the relevance of the 2030 agenda and uh, its ability to meaningfully impact lives. So basically, we just need to make sure that we do balance our legitimate concerns, security concerns, uh, with the real needs of the world and, and, and development at the cost of the constant, uh, what I refer to as perpetual raging conflicts, I think is something that we really need to deflect, reflect deeply on. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much for those remarks. Indeed, it's kind of identifying what are the priorities. Um, and uh, I also really enjoyed what you mentioned with regards to kind of, you know, the applicability of rules and norms, because it's something which also uh, emerged from our research uh, and was uh, some, a theme which came across quite strongly. So it's nice to see that there's the synergy as well and, you know, what you can you consider as a, as a pathway for action and what we also uh, uncovered in the research. Um, so I'm conscious that uh, Erica had to leave for a, a, a prior engagement, um, but I do have one remaining question, which is really looking to the next step. So where do we go from here? And I have a kind of two-pronged question, and my first um, uh, question pertains to, to uh, the, the use of these types of methodologies. So I'll turn to you first, Chris, on this. Um, and specifically, you know, our study used um, futures and foresight methods to uh, dig deeper in the space and uh, help people talk to us about these kind of wicked problems. Someone, someone used this wording, and I'll uh, use it as well. Um, uh, how could, from your perspective, and you know, as head of the Futures Lab, um, how can we continue operationalizing these types of methodologies to aid with such kind of pressing and intractable and complex issues? Um, yeah, I mean, so um, some really um, probably uh, practical things, um, I think, in any case. Um, the first thing is um, let's not fetishize these approaches. Um, these are these are just approaches to to help us to to think through complexity, um, and uh, and and they're absolutely accessible uh, to everybody. Uh, we need to make sure that um, we're not fetishizing uh, for strategic foresight because it's something we can all use and and probably uh, should all use in, in on a variety of different uh, levels and and decision points. Um, and if not, um, you know many people will already be using elements and probably have been for decades. Um, the second thing um, I would say is that we need to, uh, once we start adopting uh, more use of strategic foresight, we need to make sure that we don't become complacent. Um, you know, establishing a futures lab and making sure we've got uh, lots of people who are able to use strategic foresight isn't the end game. The end game is to create positive change for our world, and we need to make sure that we're applying these um, tools, methodologies, and approaches to a diversity of challenges um, across our across our world. Um, the third thing that I would say is that, um, you know, linked to that second point, we need to be deliberate about how we, how and when we use strategic foresight to linking it to processes, some of which do exist, some of which will emerge over the, over the coming months and years, but being deliberate about the decision points and, and processes that we're trying to 
uh, we're trying to help improve and, and complement through the use of uh, futures thinking and strategic foresight tools and methodologies. Um, the fourth thing that I'll say um, is around accessibility. Uh, we need to make strategic foresight accessible. Uh, we know um, we're quite familiar with, with its kind of provenance, where it came from, um, and, and we need to make sure that um, it, it becomes something else as we move into a more complex world, and that the, the strategic foresight itself is something that is adaptable to a whole diversity of thought from different geographies, from, 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 um, from the geographies from, from, from where it came from. And that accessibility point really points towards um, strategic foresight not being owned by a select few people in organizations, but being embraced by entire organizations because it's one of many sets of tools and methodologies that can help to transform our world's organizations in the world in, in the way that, that our world needs them to transform in increasing complexity and, and complicatedness. So doubling down on accessibility, not fetishizing the tools, making sure we don't become complacent once we have started to imbue these approaches. And then, and then again, um, you know, foresight is something that can be inspirational and, and truly engaging to, to all levels of, a, of an organization. So, so making sure we keep it inspirational as well as, is, is something that I think is, is important to us. Over to you. Thank you very much for these reflections, Chris. That's really helpful um, uh, to, to hear. Um, and now I want to turn to you, Helena, with a slightly different question, um, and particularly with uh, Namibia being one of the co-facilitators for the Summit of the Future. I'm curious to know your thoughts as to how the outputs of this study could be taken forward, um, particularly in light of the Summit of the Future, but of course um, other um, kind of uh, initiatives within the multilateral community. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. I think emerging threats, opportunities, and risks give us an advantage point. Uh, without preempting the intended outcome of the Pact for the Future, I think I can proffer a few, few ideas. I think through the Summit of the Future, we have the opportunity to do some agenda setting. We have an opportunity to coordinate principles, and we have an opportunity to set the global ambition for what is important for us in the next phase of our development trajectory. Uh, I think the summit gives us an opportunity to treat policy as living and really show how we can employ adaptability and a malleable approach to public policy on the global scale. Uh, as the future is something that will always remain unpredictable, the aim here is not really so much to predict the future, but to work on the element of preparedness. And as we do that, we must adapt not only using the basis of the global geopolitical realities that we face today, but also look, looking at the threats of tomorrow. The negotiation process leading to the summit of the future is an opportunity for us to really uh, while it's a member state-led process, I think there's scope for broader participation um, and input from a multiplicity of stakeholders. And I think there's great value in stakeholders working together with member states to really advance the issues that they deem important. Lastly, I just want to uh, speak to the issue that Chris had spoken to at length around multilateralism. And I think the Summit of the Future also presents us an opportunity to, uh, as Chris uh, said, not just to tweak multilateralism, but really to get embedded in, in how we can strengthen multilateralism. And I, I fervently believe that multilateralism is still the glue that holds the world together. I think the norms and rules-based order that global governments, governance affords us is very important. But we must, must ask ourselves, how can this be strengthened? And how can representation be uh, better reflected so that interests are better reflected? I think this is particularly important for those of us who weren't uh, at the table at the formation of the United Nations. And this is something that will consistently come out as a cross-cutting element throughout uh, the discussions uh, relating to the summit of the future. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I think the last question I'll ask is just how can we safeguard global commons because I think there are many of those. And, and uh, when we speak about the future, we must be able to use the point of departure of what we've been able to build up to today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Helena, for these parting words of wisdom. Um, we do have a few minutes uh, for a Q&A. Um, I can see the, the chat online has been very active, um, but I also want to allow participants in the room in case you have any questions or comments. Um, and I also have a wider question for you to either answer or reflect upon as you uh, leave this session um, as to whether what pathways for action you think could exist or could be explored to address the threats mentioned today. Uh, as well as those that the panel did not have the time to touch upon. Um, but with that, I just want to see if anybody has any questions or comments. Uh, um, if you just press the button. Yeah, so that's 3084. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bina Nepram, and uh, I have, wear many hats, but today I am uh, speaking as a board member of the International Peace Bureau, which is the world's oldest peace organization. Um, I just want, I'm touching on what Chris actually used the word sacred spaces. Um, I also belong to the, uh, an indigenous community, and I was wondering, in, as we are reflecting on the world for 2024, 20, 45, and beyond, it is actually the 500 million indigenous people who live in over 90 countries and territories who have actually faced genocide for over 500 years and actually survived through catastrophe after catastrophe. And I wanted to know if your research is engaging indigenous communities around the world, because without indigenous peace building and disarmament, we will continue to be revolving around a world of a continuum of violence which, 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 which we know we do not want it anymore. So just wanted to know those engagement in this particular regard for the wisdom and the sacred spaces that the hold can actually heal people and bring peace for this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I suggest we just take one more and then answer both together. Um, so it's 3148. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you, Brinkman. I'm the permanent observer of uh, the International Development Law Organization. Um, I'm um, uh, usually an optimist. Um, but I'm really worried by the fact that uh, politicians are not able to think not even beyond the next elections, um, and um, let alone think about to 2045. Um, and I think we see that in particular in climate change. The cost to address climate change is immediate, and that's often the case with, um, if you think about how we need to address some of these issues in the long term, um, but the benefits are in the future, um, and certainly they are beyond the next elections. Um, so, you know, economists call this a time inconsistency problem, and, and uh, you know, the discount rate is not going to solve that problem. Um, uh, it, it, so how are we going to address that? How, what are really a way to force politicians to make decisions that are perhaps against their short-term interests. And we need politicians to make these decisions, um, unfortunately. Um, uh, and you know, one, one perhaps way, and I'm not sure it is a solution, but it's, uh, you know, what we see around the world with regard to climate change is legal action. Um, and you see the European Court of um, being, uh, having a lawsuit from, from young people. I mean, really young people. I'm sitting there. Um, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much both for your, um, your questions. Um, maybe I'll just touch upon shortly on your question and then also give the floor to Helena and Chris uh, to weigh in on either or both of the questions. Um, I think you're entirely correct in that uh, any you know, research that aims to um, uh, provide future scenarios or look into the future should be inclusive of everyone regardless of ethnicity, gender, age, etc. And, uh, you know, all the qualifiers are necessary. Um, so indeed, uh, these, you know, different communities should all be involved in having a say and expressing um, themselves. Indeed, when we did the research, we found that uh, people from you know, either from different genders or different regions or different backgrounds, did have a very different perspective on what is a threat and what could be done to address it. So sometimes the pathways for action went from, you know, from very kind of um, 
different, very different kind of items from, you know, changing the way in which we operate on the day-to-day -day level to enforcing international law. So I think that, that your comment is entirely right and that, you know, there should be this engagement. And I think a broader question is also how can we ensure that these communities are engaged when we come to them with these initiatives to make sure that there is this ability to engage with us and to understand the importance of their engagement because that is also something we uh, struggled with sometimes is getting people's um, buy-in and understanding and the importance of this research. But it's a very valid point and a very valid concern and futures research definitely um, if it doesn't already, should definitely take that into account. But I also want to let the actual people on the panel reply. So um, I, I don't know whether Chris or Helena, either of you want to go first. Oh, uh, I think you've been nominated. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I won't speak to the point of indigenous uh, people because I think you've covered it well. And I think this is a discussion that we can continue to have. Very happy to, to, to take insights on that, especially as we start broadening the space for insights around what we'd like to do for the future. I think what history has taught us is that we've been able to create, whether we look at an example of the United Nations Charter, or we look at the Human Rights uh, Declaration, documents that have substance and that have longevity. They're not necessarily cast in stone and limited to a particular time period. I think if you read the Charter, you may feel that it was written today, but it wasn't. Um, and I think with that's maybe one of the idealistic sort of intentions we have with the Pact for the Future, where we want something that can outlive current circumstances. I think there was wisdom in carving out a space for future generations in the actors and, and the considerations that are to feed into the, the Pact for the Future. And I think in uh, the talk around uh, an envoy for future generations, I think that's really the space in creating room for intergenerational dialogues. And, and, and that's the pressure point that I think politicians will have, that it's not just for and about them and the time and space that they have carved out for themselves now, but really for generations uh, beyond theirs. So that's, that's really the thinking that I can, I can share on, on that particular question. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. So if you don't mind, Chris, um, uh, the ambassador will just take the floor and then I'll turn to you. It's precisely on the same point. I mean, we have this discussion. We had that in Germany recently by a constitutional decision, a constitutional court that a decision henceforth cannot be made at the expense of future generations. It is really, it's a bit, I think, of do no harm with a much longer period. And I think it is a normative framework that can be expanded. We're far from, from a solution, but I think simply justifying in, in the public discourse that you have to think beyond the next five years and think of our future generations is a normative framework for discussions of policy, which I think in, in the long run can make a difference if you have to justify this, uh, you, you know, your, your short term versus the long term decision you're making. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, Chris, over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Sarah. Um, just, just two uh, brief points. Uh, one, uh, in terms of indigenous uh, indigenous, indigenous communities and, um, um, and and the foresight space, there are um, uh, some efforts, not enough, uh, being done in, in this respect. So let me just say that uh, first and foremost. Uh, but some some kind of bright spots across across the UN where this um, where these very complex questions are being grappled with. Um, and so I just wanted to draw our attention towards. Um, uh, UNDP, uh, the um, Bureau for Asia and Pacific, um, in August 2022, uh, produced a report, released a report called Indigenous Futures, Reimagining uh, Development in Asia and the Pacific. Um, I found this um, report to be hugely insightful, um, and I think that it is one of those um, points uh, that we should all be learning from across the, the UN system in, in this regard. So I wanted to highlight that report, and if it's possible to, to share that with, with participants. Um, Sarah, I'll, I'll share the link with you, because I, I, I found it to be very, uh, very, very insightful and, and also incredibly important. Um, secondly, um, and to build upon the, uh, the comments of the ambassador, um, there are um, across the world, you know, we have uh, governments who are uh, really embracing um, this approach uh, to being good ancestors and to uh, looking beyond uh, 
more typically short-term election cycles. Um, and so I wanted to draw your attention to um, Wales. Um, they have a, a future commissioner who is um, independent from government, um, but accountable to people, um, and, and his role is written into, into legislation um, with, um, with a, a, quite a lot of success, including, um, well, quite a lot of success, including uh, preventing um, the building of new roads uh, across, across Wales. Um, and we see these um, efforts um, emerging from across the world. I really am looking forward to, to seeing uh, the results of the Summit of the Future, because I do think that there's huge opportunity for us to share these uh, promising and emerging practices across uh, the member states that, that form the, the United Nations. But, but that's just another example I, I wanted to draw our attention to. Over. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I'm conscious there's questions in the chat, but we are out of time, so I will hand over to Giacomo for some closing remarks. Thank you, uh, Sarah, and thank you to all of our speakers and to all of you for uh, uh, joining us today. It's been such a fascinating discussion. I think we could have probably continued for a while. I've copious notes with uh, new uh, uh, concepts and words and ways of expressing thoughts that I'm definitely going to reuse, so thank you so much to uh, all of our speakers. Um, uh, it's been, a, it's been a great event. This is, a, as I said, it's just the, the beginning of a journey, at least at Unidir. Um, we, you know, uh, this project has been uh, pioneered by the Security and Technology Program, but it's part of the broader Unidir's Futures Lab, which is kind of a, uh, uh, if you want, uh, uh, a container or a space that we have developed within Unidir to try to be a little bit more experimental with the work that we do. And we hope that it's going to be uh, well received by you, by the community. It is actually, we are demand driven, so to speak. So if you find that this is the sort of work that can help, you know, pushing the agenda and pushing the envelope a little bit further, uh, we really uh, welcome your, your feedback. Um, I had tons of questions or comments myself, but we're out of time, so I think we have to wrap up. Uh, but please do join me in a, a round of applause to thank all of our speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. We'll, we'll let you go. Yeah, thank you.